Well, today I am joined by Father Lawrence Kleenowork and Eric Ibarra to discuss the papacy. And I've had both of these uh, gentlemen on the channel in the past, and they have been just a delight to have on the channel to interact with outside of those videos. And they were kind enough to come together for a dialogue on the papacy, Father Lawrence representing a Orthodox perspective and Eric representing a Catholic perspective. I'm not gonna put the weight on either of them to represent the entirety of their tradition, but they are offering their perspective on this incredibly important topic of the papacy. One of the major kind of stumbling blocks for people on their journeys into either of these traditions is figuring out this question, which many of you might relate to, and also a major point of division in the churches today. And so I'm excited to jump into it. And both of you, thank you so much for being here. My role in this, this is not a debate, this will just be a dialogue. And so for the most part, I'm going to let these gentlemen run with the conversation. But I wanna start with this question on kind of getting into the early church evidence. And there's this question of like, did the East and the West ever agree on this topic? So it's obvious that today, Orthodox and Catholics disagree on the question of the papacy and all of what that might look like, maybe a Vatican I definition, right? But it's less obvious when these uh, disagreements started to arise. So from your guys' perspective, was there ever agreement on this? Or from the very beginning, did the East and the West see things differently? And uh, Father Lawrence, why don't we start with you? Yeah, it's it's a really good question because I was trying to read Eric's book uh, before this. It's a long book, uh, and uh, I think it's a good book worth reading. So uh, kudos, Eric, for the work uh, in the book. Um, uh, it's uh, it's interesting to read. And on this one question, I was left puzzled as to what you were trying to say, because on the one hand, you say fathers of East and West, Greeks and Latins should not disagree. I like that idea, by the way. I think it's it's true. On the one hand, you seem to document at some length a number of scholars, many Catholic scholars who say, well, uh, there was an agreement to disagree, a modus vivendi, I think you quote that, vivendi, use uh, the expression there, Latin. Um, so there was an agreement to, to be together with some awareness that there was some possible tension around how Rome understood itself and perhaps how um, the East, um, you know, managed to to work with that. And maybe a term that um, would be helpful um, is the term um, octoritas, right, in Latin, because I think perhaps the disagreement might be the potestas of the primate of the common union, not so much the octoritas that was recognized to, to the Church of Rome, and then, you know, by extension or in a different way to the Bishop of Rome. And a good example, in fact, I was trying to reread uh, the story of, uh, of Bishop Victor, Pope Victor, we call him now, but uh, Bishop Victor of Rome. And it's interesting how um, you, the background is that um, Bishop Anisette of Rome agreed to, to disagree with the Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna. They could not quite reconcile their view on when should we celebrate Pascha slash Easter, but they agreed that, you know, well, let's just cohabitate with, with, uh, with kind of a troublemaking difference, so to speak. And then we move to Bishop Victor around the year 180 yeah, and Bishop Polycrates of Ephesus, you know, says, you asked me, Victor, to summon the bishops, which I did, right? So uh, Polycrates was happy, it seems, to accommodate a request of octoritas. And he said, I did that. We talked about it. You know, here's all the bishops. But then when they don't agree, then they protest us you know, is rejected. And I think there is somewhere um, a sense that East and West uh, did work things out. Um, uh, you document in your book, I think it's it's helpful how many, for how many years uh, East and West or, you know, Rome and the East were in fact not quite in communion. And, and it was troublesome. It bothered them. You could tell it, it wasn't right, but it wasn't the end of the world. I mean, it wasn't like, 
suddenly we're not saved. We're not, you know, we have no sacraments where we don't have saints, just that it's just not right. And um, eventually it does explode for many reasons, good and bad. Uh, and then we have the, the great schism. Um, but it, it does seem that on the one hand, we can affirm, and I'll let you then speak that, yeah, the, the fathers need to be harmonized, right? It's just, we just, they, and I think we can, by the way, to a large extent, harmonize them. At the same time, we do see a consensus that uh, there was this agreement to make things work out with kind of a disagreement over how far the Roman primacy could turn into a, a power. And that's just it's in my assessment of the, of the record. And I think to an extent, your book seems to at least agree to, to an extent on this analysis. Yes, uh, Father Lawrence, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your compliment and <clears throat> and your question. Um, you know, to to answer Austin's question, uh, just as a preliminary before I uh, answer the questions you brought up, is uh, did the East and the West ever agree on the Roman primacy? And that's a good that's a good question. So I I would say that. Um, I take issue with the question, but in a very good way. <laughs> in other words, the question has to be asked, okay? But here's my preliminary answer to that, is that uh, it almost assumes that there was an East versus West already in the first uh, millennium. Um, and so it's, you know, it's the question is like, did they ever agree as if the East and the West were real ecclesial entities um, that sort of had a, uh, uh, you know, you had to interview both of them to see what they believed. And that's not the kind of consciousness that I think that uh, the Christians in the first millennium had. And, and so I think that, you know, it, it serves as a good preliminary to say that what we want to say is that there is no east and west in christ right fundamentally if there's no jew or greek as paul says then there's no latin or or greek as if as if both of them had you know pertinent differences related to the kingdom of god you know um so the point there that i want to make is that the latin fathers are the fathers of the greeks greek christianity and the greek fathers our fathers to Latin Christianity. And so there shouldn't be any part, in my opinion, there shouldn't be any partitioning of the two. And yet, as you note, as you note it, and as I noted in the book, uh, it is a very, it's, a, it's an entirely appropriate question. Because what we do see from the data is a, uh, an eventual split that occurs. And the material that splits the two sides didn't just pop up when they split those the material had been there for centuries and so that's why in in the book i talk about how certain scholars talk about two mutually exclusive views coexisting already in the first millennium and uh, to ex to a certain extent, I think that that's true. I I don't go all the way with certain um, you know historical theologians that would just say that the East was entirely uh, of a different mindset than the West. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, an Orthodox might say that of course of course the East agreed with Roman primacy because the first millennium had Orthodox popes of Rome. And they all held to the view of primacy that uh, the best of Eastern Orthodoxy believes today, which is embodied in, you know, perhaps the See of Constantinople and Antioch and Jerusalem and Alexandria, sort of in that antique patriarchal sense. And so an Orthodox person might answer this question. Of course, they, there was an agreement over primacy. But I would say that... Um, there was an agreement, but there was also significant disagreement. I think that, as we'll probably get into later, there were several significant venues where the Greeks and the Latins agreed 
on the nature of Roman primacy. And yet, lest I run the risk of oversimplification and historical revisionism, worse off, uh, I want to say that there was also significant points where the East simply rejected the commanding authority of the Apostolic See of Rome. And uh, so I, I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, but the, the, the points where the East did accept the Roman primacy as a, div, a divinized institution that's indispensably etched into the nature of the church, I think it was done in venues which create an authoritative standard for which both Latins and Greeks should account for. Um, and so that's that's what I would say about that. Um, you know, Father Alexander Schmeyman is, uh, you know, another scholar. Also, Father Lawrence has said this in his book, on his, uh, his Broken Body, which is also an excellent study that everybody should read, um, is that the East did, uh, even if unwillingly, there were times where, you know, we talked about this modus vivendi. That was a term that uh, uh, Yves Congar, the late Yves Congar, used. Um, Schmeyman admits that it seems as though the papal claims, even as matched with Vatican I, were blurted out and even put on the text of certain documents uh, where it seems to have, have been mutually accepted, um, but perhaps the Greeks didn't, you know, they saw it as advantageous to accept at the time, but internally they didn't really accept it that way as proof because of other things they said and did. Um, and so I, I would say that about, you know, it's a yes or no. There was acceptances, very significant acceptances and agreement, but then there was also disagreements. Uh, and to get to Father Lawrence's question on Pope Victor, I, I think that it is a good question, Octoritas versus Potestas. Um, and in that case with Victor versus the Asian churches, I think you have an argument for the papacy and you also have an argument against the papacy because um, you have Pope St. Victor uh, clearly attempting to exert extraordinary disciplinary power um, over the East, right? Um, you know, trying to, to, to basically exit the Asian churches out of the common union, right? And, um, and then you've got uh, the Asian synod under Polycrates saying, well, we refuse to abide by that. Now, so you have on the one hand, a saint in the Catholic and Orthodox Church, Pope Victor, who occupies the church, which St. Irenaeus says is a universal doctrinal norm for all the churches in addition to the other apostolic churches, but Rome being the most notable for her credibility. So you have a credible, a credible see exhibiting this sense of universal responsibility, you know, uh, and he, he's claiming to have potestas, right, power over the churches in the East. Uh, so there you have an evidence of it being claimed. But then you also have Polycrates, who's also a saint in, in the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, who shows, and he's all the way back in those early years uh, in the Ephesine tradition of the Catholic Church, um, showing no uh, hesitation uh, to, to refuse obedience. And so I think you've got evidence on the one hand, but then you've got evidence against. If I can yeah. jump in here just for one moment, sure. uh, because I think this might be helpful to clarify for people as we go forward. You know, in this first question we've talked about, uh, did the East and the West ever agree? And as you both have talked, we've thrown out ideas like uh, authority and power or in Latin, uh, because that's the nature of the discussion. Uh, Eric, you talked about like a divinely instituted office. It might be helpful just like in brief, when we're talking about these early periods and we're talking about Roman primacy, what exactly are we talking about? Because 
in some ways we're saying, you know, they had diff disagreements on some of the finer points, but in some cases they kind of agreed to disagree, like they found a way of working it out. Um, and perhaps sometimes when it was convenient, the East accepted certain things. But maybe just so we can like kind of put a, a pin on what we're talking about in this sense of Roman primacy, in, in brief, um, so that we're all on the same page, when either of you are talking about Roman primacy in the, in the first millennium and what it is that is being agreed upon or disagreed upon, what is it? So to both of you, just Roman primacy in the first millennium, what does that mean for the purpose of this discussion? So I'll, I'll you know, briefly mention, uh, that's a great question because um, we have to define our words. Otherwise we have equivocation, which is a word undefined with a shifting meaning. So primacy is of course being first, right? In, in some sense. Now it's tough because the primacy say of a father and his family or the primacy of a bishop in in his church, um, you know, there's all divine primacies. Um, maybe the primacy of um, um, an archbishop or patriarch among his fellow bishops, that a form of primacy as well. Um, the primacy of maybe the mayor among the citizens, right, or the governor. Uh, those are primacies of some kind. I think there's a real sense. Uh, that um, early on, and we see this um, with St. Ignatius of Antioch, that the Church of Rome holds a, a form of primacy of love, right? There's something in which it's, it's, it's a beloved church, it, it helps a lot. You know, every Rome leads to Rome was the, the saying back then. Um, it's the place of repose of the great apostles Peter and Paul. So from, from the early days, nobody really questions the fact that the Church of Rome, and by extension, or maybe it's in reverse, but first the Church and the Bishop, and um, is is honored as having a you know a special place, especially because Jerusalem is a longer you know has been destroyed in seventy and goes through really difficult years. So there's a form of primacy there. The question is, what is it, right? Uh, I think nobody denies that. We see primacy in some form uh, early on, and then there's kind of a, a back and forth as to what it's going to mean. Understandably, Rome wants to kind of yank, <laughs> yank the rug their direction, and there's some back and forth. You know, it's like, a, uh, um, and in that sense, um, for example, um, uh, Sardica, this council, I think is 352, 353, kind of defines, I think, for for the East, right? For the, the Greek speaking um, uh, East. And in this sense, there is kind of Latin speaking people and there's Greek speaking people, right? If you look at the, the acts of those synods or councils, you typically have a Greek text, have a Latin text, and sometimes they don't quite match. It's really interesting to compare sometimes the records in both languages. But in Osorica, there's an agreement, it seems to me, that Rome will have a primacy, at least in the sense that appeals can be lodged to Rome uh, by bishops in trouble, right? Um, and that Rome may refer the case uh, to a tribunal to be determined. So it's a form of cassatio in French, not quite appeal, it's a different form. But And if you read the Acts of Sardica, it's interesting because the bishops agree. So the Eastern Greek bishops say, we agree. Let us honor the memory of the Apostle Peter uh, by granting to Pope Julius, so it's kind of personal too, right? So there's kind of a personal charism, um, the right to, you know, receive these types of appeals to be referred to another tribunal. Um, and that primacy was accepted um, even by, by St. Photius, as we, we call him, St. Photius the Great, right? He never, I think, challenged that primacy of Rome. And uh, that was kind of a functional mode um, that you know rome got basically a petrine recognition of where it came from memory of apostle peter the greeks said hey we agree and it's kind of limited it's not you know intrusive it's an appeal form um and then we have supremacy which is really kind of what i would call the vatican one form um which is kind of this kind of absolute power um um you know over everyone you know the faithful the bishops uh, uh, you know, the Pope can be judged by no one type of, of approach. And that's kind of supremacy. Uh, I would call that supremacy. So there's there's shades of, um, 
of white, to use that term here, uh, shades of white, uh, you know, from from uh, primacy to supremacy. And there's an evolution, it seems, in time where the, 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 the two sides at some point kind of disagree too strongly about it. And that's probably around the, you know, the, the 900s uh, when this definitional uh, collapse takes place. Yeah, um, that, that's a good that's a good uh, definition. So when I'm using the term Roman primacy, you know, you, it is something more explicit and defined than, uh, you know, a general primacy that has, you know, room to be uh, sort of uh, seen as just a, a primacy of honor, for example, that's a term that I think Father Lawrence and I can both agree it it entailed some prerogative of authority, um, but the Catholic side, you know, and I'm I'm a Catholic, so I'm committed to saying that our doctrine of the Roman primacy is not just that Rome was a very prestigious church, and her relics gave her a sense of u- unique priority, um, or that the memory of Peter and Paul or the civil status of the Roman city-state, um, you know, as a uh, sort of like a cumulative uh, primacy. What, what we're claiming is that when Jesus stood in the flesh before the apostles, he singled out St. Peter and gave him a government, a governmental role, in the church within the apostles and over the the whole church and that primacy of government uh doesn't die with peter it 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 lives on and it it's taken on or it's inherited um by a lineal succession to a certain station where he left that prerogative which which we believe is circumscribed to the church of the roman city and that primacy of prerogative was divinely instituted it involves supreme teaching authority supreme disciplinary authority um so that means jurisdiction and um it's also part of the essence of the church which means that it can't be um uh sort of uh Uh, neutralized set aside or even put out of commission uh, because it's part of the essence of the church and so that would be the definition that is very mild definition but it it, kind of gets the point across more Uh, obviously Vatican I was more explicit in all of its terminology but um, I do agree with Father Lawrence that uh, early Christians did hell to Rome as a having a special position, for example, St. Ignatius of Antioch. Um, But his, what he says really doesn't get us in, you know, into enough detail to say whether it's what I'm saying or what the Orthodox would say, or what an Anglican would say. Uh, The same thing with Clement of, uh, Clement of Rome's letter to Corinth. There's just not enough detail to really say you know, we, we've got signs of a sense of being responsible for other Christians, but that could be interpreted in a number a number of ways, right? So I think when we get to the Pope Victor, we what we just talked about, we start to see uh, this sense of a possession of disciplinary jurisdiction. Uh, we see it also in 217 to 18, where Tertullian says that the Bishop of Rome, uh, the Pontifex Maximus, wrote a, an edict on how to how to administer absolution over certain penitents. And the idea is given that this was some sort of an exertion or an intrusion into the North African churches. And we see it again with Cyprian of Carthage and Pope Stephen. Um, but we do come to this point of agreement, like Father Lawrence was saying, at the Council of Sardica, and uh, uh, I think it's 343. And at that council, it is true that um, what you have there is an organized appellation. Uh, it's not as if Rome is, it, you know, it says, well, 
every problem that ever exists, you go straight to Rome, and everybody's going to wait in line until Rome gives an answer. That would have been um, totally impractical. Um, I mean, even Rome, as uh, you know, whether you're looking at the Republic or if you're looking at the imperial uh, forms of government before the Republic, not even Rome conducted its affairs through this immediate uh, mannerism. It was always through metropolia and civil representatives looking over certain group provinces that would have management in subsidiary levels far before it ever got to the you know the throne of the, the Roman Empire. Um, and so I think the church adopted that sense of this localized provincial administration of affairs, uh, the principle of subsidiary, which seems to be naturally, uh, it seems to be na natural and just natural philosophy of politics and political theory for things to be administered on the lowest level first and as much as is possible to keep it in that limited boundary before penetrating to a larger one until things can't be managed, in which case a certain hierarchical apex needs to step in and give a steer on the ship as to where things are going to go. And at that point, it, it's, it, 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 it depends on a singularity. There has to be one single uh, entity that's steering the ship. And that seems to be how, you know, the secular government at the time understood it. And we see that the church uh, also at Sardica recognizes this, that the throne of St. Peter, they say, um, the throne that the head of the head of the church is the throne of St. Peter. That comes from one of the letters from Sardica to uh, the other churches at the time. At the council itself, they recognize, like F Father Lawrence said, when issues cannot be resolved, an appeal is lodged. But Rome doesn't say, okay, let's get everybody ready. Let's get some a dispatch to travel all the way there every single time an appeal comes in. No, they said they're going to have to, again, go to a nearby tribunal, which can review and kind of like a circuit court, you know, look at this again in a, in, 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 in a way where there's more representation of the higher authority uh, in hopes that it could get resolved on that level. But if it can't get resolved on the local, the regional, or eventually the wider regional patriarchal level, then there is the first C that could himself um, make a decision if it you know, came to that uh, extremity. But that kind of concept still exists today. You know, at the Council of Trent, for example, there was a canonical limitation on people bringing their problems to Rome. Uh, you couldn't just go to Rome with your particular problem if you were in France or if you were in Germany or if you were somewhere else. You'd have to bring it, to, you know, today we have the Roman Rota, the Apostolic Signatura, and the Va you know, Vatican tribunals have to first, you know, see if this could be done in the local place that it came from before it, it gets to the table of the Pope. But the, the thing that Sardica solves for us, I think, is that it, it tells us that the primacy of Rome is traced back to uh, an apostolic design between Jesus and Peter. And so let's talk about that because yeah, I, I don't want uh, you know that, yeah. to over time. Um, yeah. Though I think it's it's critical though with Sardica to recognize that the the Greek bishops had to agree to consent to it. I think that's really there was this agreement to find a a, a mechanism that would work out. And that would be not an appeal, but a, a referral back, right, Cassasio. But on the Petrine issue, I think it's really critical uh, because I agree with you uh, in the Petrine DNA of the church, right? I think you've read my book. Yeah. So the, 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 the issue, though, is uh, what is the church? And when we talk about different ecclesiology, sometimes we say, oh, yeah, um, you know, there's the, the, the East was uh, uh, primacy is fine, but we kind of, you know, agree to it, you know, based on political um, needs. 
And that's kind of true. And then there's the, you know, the Latin is, no, Roman is the, you know, the P trine C, the P trine C, and, and that's it. At a deeper level, I think what we need to go, to go back to is is the, the view, which I think you discuss in your book, that there was an agreement, I believe, East and West, uh, that in the church, being the local right organism, uh, there was the bishop, the presbyters, the deacons, the Eucharist, the people, and that the bishop held the place of Peter in the church. And we find this theme over and over again. So in the church, you know, the the bishop is Peter and the presbyters are like the apostles. And we, we see that, um, in fact, in Origen, he talks about how the bishops claim Matthew 16 right for themselves. We see that very strongly in St. Cyprian, who, who uh, I believe, you know, gave primacy of honor based on that. So. But if we accept this idea, I think you do, that um, there was this, this understanding that the in the church, meaning the Catholic church, the local church, the bishop was Peter, then among the churches, if we have to look for, you know, a, a first church, you know, since the Petrine factor governs the local church, you know, let us honor the, the see where Peter died by recognizing some primacy right and it's a process to to rome but i think the tendency has been so for example when 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 pope leo writes and peter has spoken through leo it's true but if you read more of the same it could be said of any bishop any bishop was in fact peter uh briefly i was just reading last week the life of uh, bishop uh, saint luke of crimea he was a surgeon and he was also a bishop and there's a scene in, in his in his memoirs where he says he was in church. He hears uh, the gospel being read, uh, you know, Peter, feed my sheep, right? And he's a bishop. Now, he has abandoned his episcopate briefly for medical reasons, right? <laughs> to be a doctor or surgeon. So, and when he hears the text, he says he's overwhelmed uh, with trembling and crying from God that it's addressed to him. So this idea of, you know, the bishop is Peter, isn't just, you know, early church stuff. It's for him, it was like his spiritual experience. And I think that there's a trend that we see then, I think in the Latin West, where the only Peter is, is the Bishop of Rome, basically. And then the other bishops are apostles. And I think this earlier paradigm, which I think it was very strongly accepted and continues to be used uh, um, uh, for, for centuries, uh, needs to be reacquired that we may then re reflect on okay then you know what is the if there's you know a petrine principle in the church then among the churches right then you, you can see how rome has a, a petrine pedigree as well i think that's important to go back to that ecclesiology because i think it's really forgotten even by the orthodox to be frank right when when we sometimes say oh peter's primacy of honor there's nothing there well, the bishop has more than primacy of honor among the presbyters, right? So, but but it's also a very interesting point because a, a bishop isn't ordained; he's consecrated. He's you know, it's a different type of. You know, there's this debate over how does the bishop relate to the presbyter, right? Um, but I think there was a real risk uh, of transferring the the petrine office only to bishop of Rome, and then eventually, then it becomes where that's the only church and then outside that is no salvation and you reach kind of this this apex of without me meaning peter rome then you're out of the church you're not saved and thank god this was reversed uh i think in over the past 50 years uh you know with um in roman theology but i think it kind of went too far and um and maybe even in in your book sometimes you 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 seem to forget about that petrine principle that's at work in the local church which i think is the catholic church in a fundamental sense yeah um feel free to uh, ask any questions austin before we continue with that uh, line of thought um no i think you guys are good i mean i think the question here uh is essentially is so one are all of the bishops petrine right and, and then if they are is there some way in which the bishop of rome is not just like accidentally unique and being located in the place where Peter died, but like ontologically unique and more Petrine. 
I, that yeah. seems to be the question at play here to me. Yeah, so, to, you know, are all the bishops of uh, the successor of St. Peter is the first question, I think, because the significance with which Father Lawrence brought out here was um, very significant in relation to that. Um, so we see in the beginning from the writings of St. Cyprian of Carthage, for example, um, who's often misinterpreted by Roman Catholic apologists um, to be speaking of just those, the Roman church as embodying the throne of St. Peter or the Cathedra of Petri, the chair of Peter. Well, what we know now with clarified scholarship, even by Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox scholars, is that St. Cyprian was referring to the local church where every local church has its own throne of St. Peter. And the significance of that is Episcopal primacy. And so right off the bat, um, St. Cyprian himself looks at Matthew 16 and the text, you know, where Jesus stands in front of Peter and says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Um, he sees that as basically the, um, the, 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 the paradigm for every local church government. Um, that is the that is the bishop, and so the way that Peter related to the other apostles is the way that the bishop should relate to his presiding government, the the presbyters and the deacons. And I think that Cyprian's clear. I think even some of the early bishops of Rome are very clear about that. Um, for example, Leo the Great says there's a pig trine. Uh, strata with the local church, a petrine strata with the metropolitan, and then a petrine status with the universal chair of Peter, which he says is at Rome, which which raises the question, like Austin asked, is that an accidental reality that we reached through a series of developmental steps and distinguishing the nature thereof from the local bishop, or is it something rather uh, ontologically embedded into Christ's design from the beginning that there is these multiple petrine strata and with an apex that is just as equally divine as the other layers? And already in the 5th century, uh, Pope Innocent I, Pope Zosimus, Pope Boniface, Pope Celestine, those all came before Pope Leo. And they all give very clear evidences in their epistles that they understand the office of the Bishop of Rome. Also, and and they're, 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 they're speaking about the canonical uh, assignment of Sardica. And yet they say that it actually traces back to divine prerogatives that were uniquely and discriminately given to Peter and significantly held at his station and which does have analogical reference to metropolia, metropol metropolitical primacy, and the local primacy. And so, unfortunately, Catholics don't speak about this often enough. When, when, a Catholic, when in Catholic theology, when we think of Petrine primacy, almost everybody's thinking the Pope. And yet in the first five, six, seven centuries, there's a deeper consciousness of the other layers. But the question is, is that top layer a development that is more of, it's beside the essence of the church? Or is it something that is an instantiation of the essence of the church? And if it's that, is it of a nature that it's absolutely immovable and unshakable from the Church of Rome? So I think that's the, probably but the, right. Answer. But I think the issue is the, the word church then, because I, I would argue that certainly in the in the New Testament, the church is always the local church. That is the Catholic Church. Um, right, there must be one bishop in the Catholic Church that's found in Nicaea, it's found in some of the, the letters, 
when then we have churches, we have a common union. So it, 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 I, it seems that there's an agreement, right, that um, there's a divine structure in the family, right, with the, with the husband. There's a divine structure in the church, meaning the bishop, Peter, we would say, you know. For the East, it seems to me that it was understood practice that the structures of, of communion, of arrangement be above that, so regional, like around Alexandria, around Antioch, um, around Rome, of course, uh, that those were functional arrangements. And uh, to this day, if you look at the uh, the statutes of the Moscow Patriarchate, it's, it's worth reading, really. <laughs> you can see what the bishops in this territory grant to their primate. A and they list, you know, all the, the prerogatives of the Patriarch of Moscow. Um, I think that other, you know, patriarchs have the same types of arrangements. Um, so the idea which of course, maybe you disagree or you do, but was like, no, these are functional arrangements based on changing realities of territory, politics, even, you know, Roman empire. And, and that ultimately though, those are, those are important, right? Those are really important for the well-being, not the essence, but the well-being of the churches to preserve their, their, their communion, because also, uh, you know, a bishop needs neighboring bishops, three of them to ordain, well, to consecrate him, to use the term. So, so the, the the Catholic Church being local is whole complete, but it's it kind of needs also the neighboring churches like cells to 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 continue. And I think what we see is there's a a a, a mechanism by which uh, there's an agreement pretty quickly with the the, the metropolitans, archbishops, right, the patriarchates, uh, and there's also an agreement about that top level, right. Um, and recently, I think it was the, the Ravina document and, and recent other documents where it was kind of spelled out pretty well, right? Uh, church and then churches and then um, that there was a, an agreement to either recognize to or confer to the See of Rome particular prerogatives, right? Uh, I think the, the debate is, you know, is this of the essence of the reality of Christianity, to use not the term church, or is this uh, something that that is an arrangement that is helpful but ultimately when it it's not functioning it it's sad maybe but it's just not destroying the the, the churches being churches and I, I think um there was a time when rome felt that way that if you were not with rome you were you were out right i think you would agree with that um i think that that has been kind of uh corrected that uh, no no you know um um, that these are still real churches, right? They can st still be saved. Or... So there's been a journey of exploration, I think, as to what that means. Perhaps we're still on that journey. And maybe there's a sense that we're making progress. Maybe this discussion is making progress as to recovering the physiology, recovering uh, what worked, what didn't work. And um, uh, But I think th that's the, the, the difference is, is what is the church? Um, is it a worldwide organism or is it, you know, a local unit? Um, so your, your time. Yeah, Eric. no, I, I think it's a great, it, it, you know, a point that, you know, uh, the writings of, for example, Father John, or uh, Met, uh, no, he's the, the late. Met the late, Paul yes. Jo uh, John of Pergamon, or otherwise known in scholarly circles as John Z. Zulis, um, and uh, some of the conceptual agreement between him and uh, Father Joseph Ratzinger, or the, then Father Joseph Ratzinger, the late Pope Benedict XVI, where the local church, because it's an instance of the Eucharistic celebration, you have nothing less than the totality and the fullness of the church, right? If you're going to try and get something more than that, <laughs> we've got problems, right? <laughs> if you've got Christ, you have everything. Um, so we definitely want to say that the local church with the bishop, uh, the single, the singularity of the bishop, the altar, and the uh, body of Christ is that's a local reality. Um, but I think you know you 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 just mentioned it, and Zizulis also mentioned it that it it also depends upon being part of the common network or the common union. Because, you know, if a local church breaks off from that, then they suffer 
from being an instance of the church, right? So, so part of their internal constitution of being a, a, a true Catholic church in the locale, um, there is dependencies on being united to the wider unity of, of, of the episcopate, right? And so at least, yeah, at least in the in the region, I would say, because the region is indispensable. Region. Yeah, right. uh, whether, you know, whether it was felt that it could be achieved practically to be to have everybody in communion, you can see in in Eusebius that it's the ideal, but there's occasional breaches that are restored. Certainly the local network is it becomes, you know, very important in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, already um, in the fifth century, you know, you start to have, uh, and, and this was a point of, it seems to be a disagreement between the, some of the Easterners then and the Latins then, where like, for example, Pope Boniface the first, he's, he's using the analogy of Christ as the vine and we as the branches as an analogy to talk about the Roman sea as the vine and, and the, the churches as branches that can either be you know, united and participating in the sap or broken off, you know, and you, you, you see that language already there. Of course, Leo the Great, I think, did hold to this kind of uh, conception. Um, and, you know, I don't know if, well, let me say it this way. I would not say that Rome has completely rejected that idea. I would say that through Vatican II and through even documents before Vatican II and after Vatican II, well, there's a, a greater concentration put on the issue of ecclesial realities that are undeniably part of the Eastern churches that are separated uh, and also the ecclesial communities that are separated and also the issue of culpability, knowledge, ignorance and whether somebody really should be imputed with guilt the kind of guilt that ancient men simply assumed very quickly about um people that are not inside uh or bishops and churches that were not inside the same communion uh and then of course you know as aiden nichols has spoke about in his book rome and the eastern churches there was this sense of partial communion things were not uh, always black and white in the early church. Um, but uh, where where you and I would disagree is definitely on this issue of the, the universal level being a functional arrangement. See, the Catholic Church would say that it, basing itself on the patristic commentaries and some of the ecumenical councils, what we have defined and detailed there is that same old story that Jesus singled out St. Peter for this universal scope of responsibility and which gets inherited not through the diffusion of bishops and patriarchs, but only in a very singular way by the Bishop of Rome. And, and so I think that's probably where you know, we, you know, but, but you, you would agree that the initial reading of this text was applied to the bishop. And then it became uh, questioned, you know, well, now we this is established. We have bishops there, are Petrine, that the question becomes, well, what about Rome? You know, I think um, um, so in that sense, um, I think that the, the, yeah, the Petrine element is important to to understand because uh, you know what, what's happening is in the in the roman model which by the way became also very much influential in the in the east but there's this idea that local churches are portions of the whole right? the whole is the catholic church and then you have particular churches local churches a diocese it's a portion of the whole and what i try to to uh, to recover i guess in, in my book was that in the for the early church i would say all the way until I want to say uh, Saint Basil for sure, right? Um, there's a real sense that that the, the the Catholic Church as a city church 
really isn't a portion of the whole, right? I mean, that it, it is the the cell in an organism, and in fact, as, as you you you, I think you talk in your book about it, is that this idea? Well, you know, yeah, there's every bishop is petrine, and there was this idea. Uh, maybe romantic, but true that there were three more Petrine sees, right? Three were a bit more Petrine. There was Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. And so often, even when, say, Pope Leo or Pope Gregory the Great, uh, Orthodox saints, by the way, uh, talk about the, the, the Sea of Peter, they also have in mind kind of this interesting idea that, sure, you know, yeah, they recognize the ancient idea that all bishops are Peter. They really like the fact that. Uh, that there's really three Petrine seas that are more Petrine, which are, you know, Antioch, Andrea, and Rome, and that Rome is the most, right? So, um, and, and this idea, you know, wasn't, uh, it wasn't like um, uh, people were saying, oh, it's crazy, or you're a heretic, you know, it was just part of the, of the exchange of ideas of, uh, of, I think you're right, it wasn't like the East was like rejecting that type of, of, of language or poetry, but it seems that the East often just Either accepted it or ignored it, right? At, at uh, Constantinople in 381, they give themselves, you know, unequal privileges, and they they do the same. They seem to. So it's interesting to see how, when again, Pope Leo says, uh, and then you know, the, the tome and the, the bishops go. Peter has spoken through Leo. It's true, but in in their minds, all Peters were all bishops were Peters. But yeah, in a way. In that instant, you know, Leo has revealed that his great doctrine was especially Petrine. So uh, I think there was always this this kind of tug of war between, you know, Rome and, and, and the East on what that meant. And it's only, I think, really uh, in the, I want to say, seven, eight hundreds that that, you know, kind of Rome is going to win a bit, uh, I think, on that on that uh, on that. <laughs> A tug of war, and then the, and then the East then goes back and says, no, no, that was just went too far with with uh, with Photius. Plus, there's troubles in Rome, right in the 900. So, uh, hopefully, there is a kind of reconversion is possible. I think that we can kind of look back on all that with, you know, the Crusades are are a long time ago, <laughs> and we can look at it and say that we we live in in humbling times, right? The, our Orthodox churches are not in not in very good shape. We have a schism going on. You know, the Church of Rome has as as troubles. I think you we all know. So maybe there's a sense of okay, we're in this state where we've been humbled by the Lord, kind of equally. Uh, you know, are we happy that there's no progress? Um, is there not a way in which um, you know the Catholic Church, being this huge organism, you know, super organized, but with troubles? Uh, can't be revived by really engaging the Orthodox Church, and can't the Orthodox Church reacquire a lot more universalism, right, uh, and coronation by reengaging with maybe one day uh, a bishop of Rome that uh, you know that is fit for the task, and and the Orthodox have never replaced the bishop of Rome, right, and we've never sent someone to Rome and said, now you're a bishop of Rome, you're the Orthodox, you know, uh, alternative. We've always recognized that in Rome is a bishop. Huh? You know, kind of love-hate relationship depends on the, the century, um, and that is important. Uh, Rome, as you know, has sometimes replaced, uh, you know, put their own bishops in eastern seas and caused local schisms. But there's a sense in which that that recognition has has continued. Uh, you know, the, the the Russian Church has always received Catholic priests without even reordaining them, just by vesting. So there's always been signs that through thick and, and thin and, and, and local circumstances of sometimes war, hatred, persecution, that that, that tissue uh, right. of churches remained. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the local church as the real Catholic church, you know, I think you did document that very well in your book, His Broken Body, all the way up to Basil and even beyond. Um, but, you know, what I think it leads me to believe the Catholic Church is understanding. Uh, even though with St. John Paul II and Ut Unum Sint, I really would like to have a discussion on how we can, without denying the es essence of the papacy, talk about a new situation, right? So that's all assumed on my end. However, um, you know, the, the local church being the Catholic Church 
still, uh, in my understanding of the fathers and the councils, it still has this dependency on the union, right? Like Cyprian would say, a, a church that's not with the common union is broken off. And so there's this sense of a dependency. And so the question is, what is that dependency that makes the local church fully Catholic? And, you know, because Austin might be wondering, the, the listeners might be wondering, well, if the whole Catholic church is in the local community, then why can't the local community sort of do what it wants without canceling its essence as a true church? Well, it, it, we all agree that it can't do that. And the question is, what does it depend upon? And obviously in the Catholic church, we would say, you know, it has to, it, it, the, 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 the true apostolic faith, it has to be in communion with the bishop or the, the patriarch, and then ultimately in union with the See of Rome. And I think that the Eastern, the Eastern Episcopate in the first millennium we we can we can refer to it as poetry, like you said, or like hyper like Byzantine hyperbole, things like this. But I I think that in a very real way, the bishops of Rome, at least, and many Eastern representatives, like Saint Maximus the Confessor, Saint Theodore of Studi, um, they really are serious that the the Roman primacy and being in communion with it is part of the indispensable nature of the church and to 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 you know to objectively go against that is to go against the order of god now i understand that there's a disagreement on that but you know instances like pope agatho's letter to the sixth council uh the statements of Phil, philip the legate at the fourth ecumenical council which, which says that Christ personally set aside Peter and gave him the keys of the kingdom and gave him the universal headship over the church in his successors for all time. So we could might say, well, the language isn't as strong to, to make for a definitive doctrine of the papacy. But, you know, as I document in my book, I do think that that's the direction that the popes of Rome are going. And I do think and, that, and I agree with you. That is the directions the popes of Rome are going, and that's where, where yeah. they went. I think the the question is um, um, this issue of having to be. Uh, I think your word is fully Catholic. I mean, have to be basically under Rome in some way. Uh, it, it it does seem clear that so Cyprian did not believe that, or Primilian, or obviously you know uh, Polycrates, Basil. I don't think so either, based on on. You know his letters about what's happening with Miletius and uh, and Paulinus, so it does develop. I think there's a real sense in the in the Ocumen, in the in the imperial system that certainly uh, the emperors really would like that. I think they really want there to be you know a, a structured system, um, and I think this does develop in some way. Uh, you know, after the 700s, and then it kind of breaks it, you know, it, it kind of breaks maybe the, gets the camel's back, but um, it, it is a late arrival. I think what we see is we have, you know, this, this Petrine uh, Episcopacy, we have a uh, Church of Rome as some kind of primacy, then we have Sardica, which is, you know, 350s, then with this back and forth over the, over Constantinople, what can it really claim, you know, versus the other uh, Petrine sees. Uh, and then we have these these crises in the east, right, where where Rome uh, kind of is called upon to kind of you know save the day because the Byzantines are always thinking about complex theological problems. That, uh, um, but it is such a long journey. But I think it does result in a an hypothesis, right? The hypothesis becomes the Vatican II system, Vatican I system uh, of this. Uh, Ex cathedra, you know, power of the Pope of Rome to to have infallible statements, and I think that becomes kind of a apart from the salvation issue, where you really see the popes and saying you're not with us, you're not even saved, and you might be not just defective, you're like you're out, right? When when the Eastern churches of uh, Ukraine, Poland today, uh, you know, reattach themselves to to the See of Rome in the Union of Brest-Litovsk, 
they have to admit they were not saved, right? If you've read the text, that, well, we were not in the Ark of Salvation, we now we're back in the church. So that, I think, went too far. That's obviously my view. I think that Rome has kind of backpedaled that, um, and I'm happy here. Um, just as some of the Orthodox have said, oh, there's no grace there, not even churches. And, you know, I think um, that's an extreme view. Um, but also the issue of the of the ability to to create these infallible statements really becomes a kind of a testable, right? The testable system. And I think that it, it, it it's hard to make it work. You know, I think there are statements that look ex cathedra to me, at least, uh, you know, um, um, I think Pope Leo X, uh, when he uh, excommunicates uh, Martin Luther, um, where I, I see statements that look ex cathedra to me that, I think even Rome would kind of say, Ugh, you know, um, that sometimes the popes have, have written stuff that were received as, you know, thumbs up, you know, um, certainly uh, Pierre has spoken through Leo, but I think there's also then this whole bunch of, of documents that, uh, uh, that just don't pass the test as a practical test of the ultimate theory of papacy. Uh, because you know, from primacy to ultimate supremacy, there's a whole bunch of steps there. Um, and I think that the East went along the way quite a bit, right? Uh, right. But I think that you, you you reach some steps where it becomes really problematic. And um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Pope John Paul was willing, I think, to to look at how a primacy, which you say, okay, it's it's in some way divine, you know, there's got to be first somewhere, uh, can be articulated and yet function in the way it functioned for a thousand years with with ups and downs. Yeah. I want to jump yeah. in here real quick um, yeah, yeah, because yeah, I, I think there's maybe one thread that uh, we've talked at at length, but I'm not sure we've quite satisfied here. At least I still have open questions and selfishly, I'm the one that uh, runs this channel. So I get to ask them. No, but um, I, and it's going to be so rude to ask for like short answers to this because it's a complex question, but I'm not sure we've really gotten to kind of terra firma on what makes a church a church. Um, because on, on the one hand, we could have an easy model where we say, oh, it's, you know, on, on the Catholic side, Eric, you're on the side of the screen. That's why I'm pointing in that direction. Um, it's a church that they have the apostolic faith, apostolic succession, and they're in communion with the Bishop of Rome. And, and that seems easy, except for it, it would seem in recent time, this has gotten more complicated because I think my best understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe this is simple, um, but that uh, the, the Vatican would now say, that the Orthodox churches are churches, but they don't satisfy that last requirement um, under kind of the easy definition. And then within, there's also this appeal of, oh, okay, like the the locality of the church. So it's where there's um, like a, a validly ordained bishop, there's a, a real Eucharist, like there you have the church. But as Eric was starting to point out, like, but it does have to be connected to the larger network and how large must that network be? And if it's just kind of regional, then if we have different regions who aren't in communion with one another, do we then have multiple churches um, because they're both trying to instantiate the local church, um, but they're not together in that. So hopefully that makes sense. Those kind of challenges on both sides. But my question just simply would be what makes a church a church on these different ecclesiological models? And then we can move into those interesting questions of infallibility and in councils. Yeah, so, in, well, I, I'm not sure if it's my turn or your yep. turn. I don't know who's it, local at. Eric, why don't you go, go ahead? Yeah, okay. go for it. Okay, so, yeah, in the in the Catholic Church, you know, we we do believe that there are um, essential constituents that make up a real local Catholic Church. And obviously, um, you know, it, it, there has to be the preaching of the gospel. There has to be the missionary episcopate with the unbroken succession that carries the right of orders the sacrament of orders um and you know so it, it but within that episcopal government uh in a certain location where you have people who have ears to hear the gospel and to receive the sacraments the local bishop being the principal leader in that context the Episcopal government has to circle around this, or it's it's got to be in communion 
with a the a, a hierarchical apex of this the Pope of Rome, and so a church that does not have unity with the Bishop of Rome or the see of the Universal See of Peter um, is lacking one of the internal constituents that make it a fully Catholic church. Now, that that begs the question because the 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 um, the Catholic Church has said over and over again, even before Vatican II, that uh, the Eastern churches that are separate separated have a true episcopate, and therefore they have they are true particular churches. And so, how in the world can the Catholic Church say one of the in internal constituents is the Petrine unity on the universal level, and then at the same time say that these are true particular churches? The reason why we say that is because for the local church, the office of the bishop brings in the, all the sacraments and which make up the dynamic of what we say in the early church. The church is in the bishop and the bishop is in the church. And if they have a valid apostolic succession, then even though they've removed that from the unity of the church, they're still, they're still tracing and ordaining valid bishops okay and because that validity of the episcopal office you have the people with him being a church now you have all you know you have valid sacraments you have um the sacramental reality of orders you have these these things that don't get obliterated even when a group goes into schism like the like the, the Nestorians or the Miaphysites, um, you know, the Coptic Syriac churches or the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, they, they, you know, we as in, in the Catholic Church, we see that them as having departed from the, the unity of the church. And yet there are certain things that haven't been obliterated. One of those things is that they do have a particular church. But in order for that particular church to be fully embedded into the design of Christ, it has to have that last component of being in, linked into the unified chain of the bishop, you know, the, the, the successor of St. Peter with the Episcopal College. So it's a very strange, uh, you know, it could be very difficult to uh, understand this, but the Catholic Church has been very committed to believing certain um the indelibility of certain things that are divine. So in the early church, baptism that was done even in a heretical community was not repeated on 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 most conditions. You know, they it was not repeated. Um, and it was also believed that other sacraments could survive even in a state of of departure from the unity of the church, even apostolic, succession um so but in order you can have apostolic succession like the, the nestorians uh, later the assyrian church of the east had or the miaphysi coptic syriac armenian ethiopic and then also the uh the the greek orthodox church that you know we said we say separated in the second millennium uh, especially with the council of florence they kept apostolic succession but they did lose an inch an internal constituent of what makes that local church fully into the unity of the church. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, to, if, if, if not, just ask me a, a question on it. Yeah. yeah, I think that's helpful. Uh, Father Lawrence, how, how would you respond to that question of what, what makes a church a church? Yeah, you know, I think it's really critical to um, uh, for those of interest in all this to read uh, Eusebius. It's, a, it's, it's wonderful to read Eusebius uh, from Pentecost to uh, Nicaea. It really gives you a sense of what the churches, always plural, looked like, right? And the common union and what made this local church a church. Uh, you know, I think when we think practically about uh, the Lord commissioning the apostles to go to the ends of the world and St. Thomas went to India, I think he knew that it was going to be impossible for the people in India to be in any way connected to the people in Rome. So I, I just don't think that he, he, he foresaw, at least for many, many years or centuries, the need for 
people in India to be under a successor in Rome. I think it's it just, it's impractical. Um, it might be nice in the future if this could be arranged to have some kind of global coronation, but I just don't see the Lord, you know, imposing this requirement on people in Persia or India or Ethiopia. Um, but, you know, the, the word valid is, is a really good Latin word, very Roman, uh, because um, St. Ignatius of, of Antioch says, only consider it as bebea, which people say really means assured, not valid, assured. This Eucharist, which is uh, served under the bishop or the delegate, or the presbyter. I think the question is then, where are we assured to have the Eucharist? Because you know, the body of Christ is the church, is the Eucharist. So where is the assured Eucharist? And the answer is yes, is where the, the, the bishop who has a pedigree from the apostles in that place, right, uh, is serving um, with his presbyters, deacons, the people, and that's where you're assured to have the church. Now, will that church be defective, humanly speaking? Well, 1 Corinthians looks to me it's defective, right? Um, uh, Revelation 1 through uh, 4, pretty defective churches. So I think there's always human defect in the church and, and the grace of Christ just kind of covers like oil and, and we're still joined to Christ by the sacraments um, and he is infallible in, in saving us. Um, so, you know, in, in my view, when New Rome and Old Rome, as we call them sometimes, decide to have some crazy mutual anathema in 1054 uh, over, you know, uh, a list of things like uh, the beard and the uh, and the bread and and you know, some more critical things, but there are still churches. See, that's the key: is that Rome is still a church with a bishop. Constantinople still has a church, and in fact, when Constantinople went through iconoclasm and it was really defective, there was still a church baptizing and saving people, though it was, you know, really bad. Uh, when Rome was under the so-called pornocracy, it was really bad. It was still a church with a bishop still saving people by God's grace and 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 the mysteries. I think that over the centuries we've developed our own unique defects. Right? Uh, there's Orthodox defects. I, I I've seen them. Right? Uh, there's Catholic defects. I go to France once a year. I've seen them. <laughs> also in the USA, are these still churches? I believe so. Right? There's still cells with with the DNA. Um, I think at some point a church can become so defective that it's, it ceases to function. Like if, if, a, if a cell church is cut off from the neighboring bishops, it can't ordain a, a true bishop and it will die. There's no more, no more bishop, no more, you know, so it will die. Um, or if we would say if a, a church uh, ordains a woman as a bishop, uh, it undoes the, the Petrine paradigm and, and apostolic paradigm. And, and it's the defect is so grave that we would say you're really not assured at all to have a Eucharist there, right? A true, a true yeah. presence. Um, and I think we're living in this world where we do have th these human defects that uh, hopefully uh, the, the DNA of God will help us repair, like, like, a, you know, like with a tumor or a disease where um, we each church is aiming towards this this ideal now does this ideal include that there's one bishop in one city yes even we fail sometimes should there be you know structures of communion in in regions countries uh, you know conference of bishops uh, yes should there be a universal point of agreement resolution like sardica and the early church you know, try to achieve yes uh, is that god's desire yes um, but I think is is the glue of Christians, you know, an, an office, right? Like the papal office. I think it works for Rome somehow, right? If you can have a Latin mass, you can be the, the dancing nun. And, and if you are under the Pope, you there's a glue there. You know, the Orthodox glue is kind of the, a spiritual experience, right? They're kind of two different ways to live in this unity. Um, so obviously I'm Orthodox. I think that it, it works okay to have the Holy Spirit as the unity, the glue um, with limitations. And uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping that somehow the Lord can help us figure this out. But I, I made the point that, you know, the imposition of a, of a submission of sorts uh, in India, wherever it was, Ethiopia to Rome, to me seems impractical and therefore um, 
not called for, at least not for centuries. Right. So, yeah, thank you so much for saying all that you said. And I don't want to make it seem like Rome is in a position that is ontologically, you know, uh, beautiful, right? We all have what our defects. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of problems going on right now in the Catholic Church. But this, you mentioned the <laughs> idea. And I think that's, you know, Austin's question, to get more to specific to his question is, you know, you've got this cell of the tr of a local Catholic church, apostolic succession. But the thing is, I mentioned, you know, the Nestorians, they maintained an Episcopal line. The Miaphysites, the today the Oriental Orthodox churches have continued an Episcopal line. And obviously we believe that the Eastern Orthodox have done that. And to some extent, we believe, uh, like the Polish National Church and some of the Anglo-Catholics have real bishops and things like this. So if, if, if they have apostolic succession and the true Episcopate and therefore the Eucharist, why aren't they united with each other, you see? And that's why we would say this Petrine mystery or the mystery of the Petrine principle of, of universal unity exists in order to ensure and maintain, even if it comes across as an imposition, um, because a lot of the things you said there are, are absolutely true. A spiritual experience, um, uh, being liturgically, um, dis, you know, in, in disciple, you know, we discipled in the liturgy of the church. The faith of the church, um, the in the bosom of the charity of the church, all these things make up the church, right? But we all know that in the economy of our lives here on the earth, we do need some sort of like plumb line when think when we can't get things in order, um, there has to be some like referee or standard which is outstanding for everybody to clearly know about and conform to to reach the ideal that we're looking for which is a spiritual experience and all those things because the the the, the separated eastern churches including the orthodox church they have beautiful liturgies they have a beautiful landscape of christian spirituality and yet there is this grievance that they are not one at the same table drinking from the same cup and and that's where I would say that in the first millennium, you have this idea being represented in councils um, and fathers and significant venues that pose as standards for us to hold, be held accountable to, which give this mystery of the universal principle of unity as a matter of law and obedience. You know, And I know that sounds kind of, you know, it sounds, you know, like Rome today doesn't speak that way. Well, I, I think Rome has re, um, she has, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? She has basically said, look, uh, we're not going to accuse people of schism. That, that's not the approach that we're, that Catholic Catholicism is going to take. We're going to recognize the best in our separated brethren and try to build as many bridges as we possibly can. But Vatican II does still say that if you've studied the, the Catholic faith and you've come to the persuasion or the convict, you know, to the conviction that the, the Catholic Church has been founded by Christ, then not to enter her would uh, make it impossible for, for you to be saved. Now, that's that's Lumen Gentium. So that's still in Vatican II and, and all those things. So that you still have that sense, but then there's the, also that ecumenical effort to try and say, we're not trying to say everybody's guilty automatically, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I hope that makes that clear. That is helpful. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to ask one final question. But uh, before I do that, I do want to just thank you both so much for your time. This has been absolutely wonderful. And what I've really enjoyed about this conversation is I think it's taken this dialogue around the papacy to a slightly different 
um, place than a lot of people are used to. I, and I, I find that encouraging. I think we're kind of in some ways moving uh, beyond like uh, Florence and just like throwing as many proof texts at each other as we can. But we're talking more substantially about like what is the church. And perhaps that has surprised people, but I think it's helpful. Um, but one place I want to, I think could maybe be fruitful here is uh, throughout Father Lawrence, you've talked about kind of like shading from primacy into supremacy. And Eric, there, you were talking about, you know, within this world, we need some type of like plumb line that comes down. Earlier, we talked about Sardica, that there's this kind of uh, precedent set up where we have the Church of Rome being this court of appeals, if you will. And in some ways, for some people, that feels not that different than kind of infallibility. Like if you're the final appeal, you have the final say, and at least functionally, if there's no one to appeal above you, like we, we can't we can't reverse that. So it's infallible, at least functionally. But for others, that feels very different than infallibility, that this is something, you know, very far on that spectrum. And so I guess what I want to get at here is if we're saying we have this precedence that the Church of Rome is the final court of appeals, but that at least from the Orthodox perspective, that's acceptable, but supremacy is not kind of where where is that line and what is the difference there like so what what would it look like to be a court of appeals but to not be infallible how can we move forward okay a lot of questions there i think what i'm looking for here is where on that line does it stop being acceptable to the orthodox for you father lawrence maybe i'll reword it for you eric yeah. um where do we go from yeah. primacy to supremacy yeah yeah so 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 yes yeah. so shortly i think it's it's critical though to realize that uh, sardica granted not a right of, of appeal or final appeal, but a, a referral right, so a referral to, uh, so the right to say, okay, we're gonna refer this case somewhere else to be re revisited and, and, and finalized. So it's a subtle difference, but I think it's critical to understand that it's it's not appeal, it's cassatio, right? It's a different kind of, uh, of referral. And uh, obviously the context is, is what well, there's a need for it <laughs> to everybody is in communion as far as the faith is concerned. There's a great respect for the Church of Rome uh, at the time and for Pope Julius in particular. So there's that personal element. And in fact, um, you know, it's interesting, the, um, the Eastern patriarchs um, in 1848, you know, replied uh, a letter to, uh, to the Pope of Rome, I forget, Pope Pius maybe. Um, and, you know, they say, yeah, we wanna, we wanna wipe off the tear of the Catholic Church. We want to find a way to, to, to embrace you again. And, and so th there hasn't always been a get lost, you know, happy to be divorced, like some people say today, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, we got a divorce. Uh, there's a real sense that has been lost, uh, which we notice uh, after 1054, that there's not, not much grieving, you know, it's like, well, these Latin crusaders, you know, um, might as well. And ever since, there's been this kind of happy to be in our own apartments, right? They have married priests, we don't, uh, we do this, they don't. So, you know, we're all going to heaven anyways uh, in the end. And so there hasn't been a huge imp impetus to really look at what that meant, you know. But it, in context, it meant uh, uh, there is unity of... Uh, a sense of unity, right, in liturgical, theological, a sense of, of a bond. And then in that context, yes, I think the uh, Sardica was a good, a good template to at least recognize what, what could be done. And that solved many problems, by the way, during the Aryan crisis. And it was, it was applicable uh, for a long time. And then finally, you know, the Orthodox system did, has worked pretty well. I mean, it, it's not perfect. We do have a schism now between uh, Moscow and Constantinople, and it's the you know, first time in, in a while, I think it might be resolved, I don't know. Um, but for a long, long time, the Eastern churches remained in communion, which is quite remarkable without having um, a papacy to really demand it. It, it was kind of, um, you know, agreed to have a first among equals in Constantinople. And certainly Constantinople does not have the, the octoritas <laughs> right, uh, of Rome for many reasons. So, um, that is causing, in fact, some kind of a, of a crisis ultimately, right? But so, so there's 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 room uh, by God's mercy only and by God's uh, work and prayer to 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 move beyond where we've been. Eric, I want to pitch this to you uh, 
and slightly rephrase. So what would that look like? And obviously, it's not going to be up to you to make this call, right? But there has been a lot of work since Vatican II and Pope John Paul II especially to try to say like, okay, let's try to figure out what this could look like in a way that would be acceptable to all parties. If we kind of take Sardica as this model, um, it, you know, what, what could the papacy look like that tries to accept a certain level of maybe collegiality, a certain level of uh, recognizing maybe a different way of conceiving of the local church as, you know, uh, then uh, Father Ratzinger was looking at, like, is there any way that we can kind of move a little closer together here? Um, what do you think that might look like? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do think that, um, you know, if, if the Catholic Church, um, without denying anything about the, the same old story that we've said, that it was, it was Jesus's intention to um, ensure the unity of the universal body by the papacy, among other things, but one of those being the papacy. Uh, I think Sardica, you know, which I, I slightly disagree with Father Lawrence there. I, yes, it is a, um, you know, not a, a, a stance like, well, if, if, if they disagree with it on the local level, they go right to Rome and Rome's court settles it, you know, it is uh, to be reviewed. So Rome has the, you know, the right to decide if something can be reviewed. But, you know, if, if the logic at the time was that if it can't be resolved there, then it, it goes to the first seat eventually. And, and it's still an appellate structure. And I think today, if, Rome did that, where Rome makes a commitment not to be uh, immediately involved in the Eastern churches or even even some of the Western uh, bodies of the Catholic Church. If they could, we could return to sort of like a, a more subsidiary uh, or subsidized organization like the patriarchs and the metropolitans of the ancient world. And where there's a commitment where Rome, out of charity and recognition that Christ is doing things through other laborers, right? Uh, the whole vineyard has workers everywhere, not just in one place. Um, and make a commitment not to be hands-on and micromanaging the churches, I, which I, I think Rome is already trying to do. Um, and... Rome only gets involved when, like I think in the first millennium it was committed to do, which is when the unity of the church is at a threat, where where a fracture is ready to happen with devastating consequences, then Rome can step in and employ its narrative that it's been given the jurisdiction from Christ, both in doctrine and discipline, to heal and, and, and the schism and bring people back to the unity of the bond of peace. So I, I think with that structure returning to a patriarchal, metropolitical, and a, more of a local um, self-governance where Rome only makes a firm commitment to recognize that it it's more appropriate, most appropriate, only to speak and put in law for everyone or a region when schism is the only alternative. Yeah, well, and, and it's, uh, it's sadly, you know, I think the issue is that um, the spiritual state, uh, you know, and that's certainly I think the, in the Western world, right, it's just pretty poor. Um, and so we're no longer sadly, you know, in kind of a very homogeneous liturgical experience. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in the way people experience their faith and it makes it more hypothetical i think that uh, my view is that there should be a a convergence in what people experience on sunday right their their spirituality their uh you know right now things have kind of really gone in separate ways uh, and um so the whole ecclesiology is important, but ultimately the liturgical, spiritual life, the the general experience you have when you go to Orthodox or Catholic churches, that has to be uh, really so close that people, it it would make sense that that these types of discussions could could be fulfilled, and and that is really my prayer. I must say, Amen. We have a lot of work yeah. in the Catholic Church to yeah. do. 
when it comes to right. when it comes to our church. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you guys both so much. I trust that this has given the viewers much to think about and uh, much to pray about. And I'll close as I always do uh, by saying until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. But until then, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. Hey, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video and I trust that you did if you spent the last hour and a half with the three of us. And just a huge thank you to Eric and Father Lawrence for their time on this. You guys can find all of their information in the description down below. Do be sure to check out their book books, both of them on this topic, and I trust their other work as well, uh, are, are just fantastic books. And hey, if, if you've stayed for this long and, and you're not subscribed, I'd really encourage you to do so. I mean, I trust you enjoyed it since you were here for so long. Um, so please just hit that subscribe button. Um, and if you want to support the channel, if you want to help uh, me be able to put on more discussions like this and make more videos, devote more time to the channel and uh, try to get it in front of more people, consider becoming a patron. And you can do so by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. And you get all types of fun perks by doing that. One of my favorites is you get to be part of Gospel Simplicity Inside Circle Book Club, where we have discussions like this between people who see things differently, who come from different church traditions, and we gather around ancient Christian texts from the church fathers, and we just try to wrestle with what was being said then, what it means for us now, and well, maybe what implications that has for the, the nature of the church. And so if you want to be not just one who watches videos like this and gets to watch them early as a patron, uh, but one who gets to be involved in dialogues, well then go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. Anyway, final plug. Thanks and God bless.